uh, uh, the area we're concerned with is that part of the throat gullet that is open, and that is the larynx. Now, the larynx is basically near the Adam's apple as far as being able to identify it on the outside, but if we look inside at a diagram, we see here a diagram from the side. This is your nasal cavity. Here are your teeth, top teeth, and your top lip and bottom lip, and the tongue. And then, right in back, we have this tube coming up, which is one area is called the esophagus, and later becomes the pharyngeal, pharyngeal wall, which is the inflamed area when you have a sore throat. Uh, here is the soft palate, at the back of the roof of your mouth. And what we're concerned with here is the laryngeal ventricle. Here's the larynx over here, and these two sides of it, you could see a little opening, are the vocal cords or lips or folds. These are interchangeable words which I'll use throughout. And it is these, the movement of these vocal cords, which we will be specifically talking about. Uh, what happens with them is that the tension and the length of the vibrating points of these focal folds are regulated, and this results in a periodic and varying modulation of the steady airflow, which is the breath, the source, and finally resulting in pitch differences as the vocal cords vibrate. This is the same mechanism that works for speaking, as for singing, as for blowing, and it is the same mechanism for a newborn baby crying as it is for a mature adult. A little bit more on the vocal cords and the kind of action that they actually go through. They are what give emotional expression to our utterances. And these vocal cords looking at it from the side. Remember here, it's actually looking at it from a top view, but from the side. They, uh, the muscular action is a result of four basic natural movements. Uh, expansion and contraction, elongation and shortening. And this the variety of these movements and the percentages of which it, it may contract versus expanding or it may elongate versus shortening have to do with the particular uh, expression or let's say the particular sound that we're looking for. Remember it is the inner ear with the brain sending a message to that part of the body to do the necessary work to get out the sound and this is what's occurring in the vocal cords. Now, if you play one note from a pianissimo to a fortissimo, in that range, your vocal cords will go through all these four movements very clearly. Uh, this movement feeds the air pulses into the vocal tract at different frequencies of vibration. Some tones are attenuated, others are accentuated, and this results in infinite numbers of sounds and in turn infinite number of expressive colors. The only thing about this is that this muscular action occurs below the threshold of conscious feeling. This means that I can't consciously feel it happening, I can't consciously give it a command and, and have it occur. What, what we can do though is via an exercise and uh, via the results, the oral results and the feeling results, we can see the action or feel and hear the action of the vocal cords at work. And this is the overtone exercises, which we'll get to later. But before we do that, we have to spend a little bit of time on other aspects of holding the saxophone, uh, specifically the embouchure area, which have an effect on the larynx and the position of the larynx. Uh, by now you should be realizing that it's a very sensitive uh, area, this larynx and vocal cords. And any kind of activity or position that places tension on it is going to inhibit its ability to act. So for example, if I see a saxophone is playing with their head very far down or very far up, either way exaggerated is going to probably make it more difficult for the larynx to uh, operate at full potential. All right? You can try this just by speaking uh, and try uh, speaking your voice in those positions and listen to the difference in sound and you, you'll see what I mean. Uh, now, the next problem that can occur by a position, a wrong position, has to do with the lower lip. And this is very, very important. As I said earlier, the lower lip uh, is doing some kind of adjusting at the reed and it's uh, very important as to how the sound will come out and the register and so forth. But before we even talk about the proper position uh, as far as the reed goes, the first thing to realize is that many people, uh, when they play with the lip in this position, like this, folded over 
the teeth in that way. They are placing pressure on the larynx. Uh, even if you just do it as I am and put your hand around the Adam's apple, you can feel some tension. It's very little, but it's enough to upset the cart. But let's talk a little bit further about why it is more favorable to have the lower lip in a more, what I call, fatter position with more skin area on the reed. The lower lip works uh, very much like the felts on the hammers of the piano. Uh, the felts cover the hammer, which hits the string, and softens the cu it cushions the uh, percussiveness of it and the vibration. And the lip, like the felt, both do the same thing, which is they absorb the extreme high and percussive overtones, therefore allowing the fundamental to come forth. Now, you know, a tone is made up of a fundamental and its overtones, and the fundamental is the source of the sound. We'll, we'll, we'll get to this a little bit later. Uh, so it's very important to have this lip area on the reed for that reason. Now, there's another very important reason, which is the kind of movement that's necessary at the reed. Due to the acoustics of the reed, it's a very simple uh, thing that you can understand. Just watch my thumb as being the bottom of the reed. The bottom, my bottom lip, excuse me. Here is the way my bottom lip would be for low notes. What am I doing? I'm covering the reed, mostly. For high notes, I tend to do this, which uncovers the edge of the reed and allows more of the higher overtones to come out, which is more of the higher pitch, higher sound. And as we go higher, the frequencies are higher. This movement at the reed is what I spoke of earlier as being the adjustments necessary. The larynx is first, but this is a natural thing. So this is something that you don't even have to think about. When you first took the saxophone up and played the first day, you probably didn't even think about the fact that you naturally went like this for high notes. And like this for low notes. Now I'm exaggerating, but it basically gives you this kind of motion, a rolling motion. Now, if I have my lip over my teeth like this, then how am I going to do it? I can only go kind of moving the saxophone, which is very awkward. So it is the outer rim, which is on the reed, yeah, the high notes, and the inner rim, that, for the low notes. So we want to get this rolling motion. Uh, the thing about the bottom lip is that, of course, everybody's teeth and lip and jaw is different. So it's very, very hard to tell somebody else to put the position in a certain place. In fact, I used to spend time, I have a picture here of one of my favorites. Pictures here. I used to spend time in, with a mirror looking at this picture of John Coltrane on this album or many other albums, but this is particularly good to see his album sure, and trying to, like with a magnifying glass, look in here and see exactly how much lip John Coltrane had on his bottom. Uh, extended on the reed. Of course, this is a little bit fruitless because there's no way that I could get it and not John Coltrane and uh, we don't have similar lips and you don't have similar lips to mine. So I have a, there's a system that uh, Joe used to use actually to uh, help you find it and it's by using the letter V as in victory or F as in first. And when you say these two letters, especially V, you realize that your top teeth strike your bottom lip somewhere in the middle of the fleshy area. V, 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 V. So what I try to do is imagine an imprint being made. Now this is also very good to use a mirror. Look at the mirror, do V, V, V. Mm -hmm. There's an imprint. And where that imprint would be is where I will try to play my middle register. C, for example. V, V. <laughs> And of course, from there, high notes will be, and low notes will be. Okay, so V is a good way of discovering where your central spot is from which you will be going in and out, moving in and out. Now, a good, a good way to practice this is to try to measure, a, at least on a tenor, about one inch in, about an inch, a little less. Put your teeth there and try to roll in and out and still keep the spot. 
That's how I do it. Just to feel the movement. It's a rolling motion. Sometimes uh, uh, saxophonists have a little problem with their bottom teeth being jagged and uh, cutting into their bottom lip. Uh, and this is something that depends on your teeth and it could be a problem and uh, you might go to your dentist and they can very easily shave down a certain amount of the teeth. Uh, after a certain amount, it's not uh, healthy to do. Or you, if you're brave, as uh, Joe Allard did to me one day, you take an emery board and you might lightly go in and take off a little bit, but I would be very careful about that depending on how sharp it is. Or if it's really a problem on an on a everyday level, take a little bit of cigarette paper and fold it into several squares as so. Of course, wet it first, and then place it over your teeth like this, and you can play with it on your bottom teeth, and there's a padding. So there are ways of getting around this. Sometimes you just have to build up a callus and get used to it. There's no other way to it. I used to have some problems, especially on soprano, which is very tight on, for sure, uh, for the first few days of playing until I built up a callus, and then it became okay. So, this is the uh, adjustment of the bottom lip, fatter bottom lip, try to have it be out, and you will hear a difference in sound between thin and thick bottom lip. Here is thin. <laughs> incontestable difference and I dare say that 99% of players who come to me with a thin lip if I have them put their lip out there sound immediately expands and gets richer and deeper okay we will uh, continue on with the embouchure elements now we're going to talk a little bit about the teeth now I have digressed a little from the larynx and we will return to it but it's important to cover this while we're in this area of the uh, mouth we kind of skip the airstream from the larynx and the oral cavity up to the mouth and read but uh, we'll make up for it. First of all, the upper teeth are in a natural bite. They are receiving the lowers. This is your natural bite. You don't have to worry about the upper teeth. Uh, I play, the way I play, I put sometimes a little too much pressure on the upper teeth and I find that I get an indentation here. Uh, truth is, it shouldn't be too much of an indentation. That probably means that you're weighing too heavily downward with your head pressure and uh, of pushing your teeth into the top of the mouthpiece. And that's gonna be no good, as is the opposite, which would be biting up too much. The lowers are basically, lower teeth are basically, for the most part, placed opposite the beginning of the facing. The beginning of the facing is where the reed and mouthpiece part. That's the beginning of the facing, the lay area, L-A-Y. And about there is where my teeth would be, of course, through my bottom lip. So I could feel the reed through my lip with my teeth, if I thought about it. The motion of the jaw, the bite itself, is a very simple motion, just like chewing. Or another way to explain it is when you pronounce the, uh, the uh, word, or not the word, the, the letters E-X, you say X, 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 chew. Very simple upward motion. Uh, it's a known physical law of Newton that for every action there is an equal and opposite reaction. Well, here it is the action and the weight of the head and an opposite and equal reaction of the bottom jaw. And it should be not tighter or looser than it has to be. It should be firm but relaxed. When I play, if you put your fingers around here, you will feel firmness but not tension. Not like this. Relax. Finally, a uh, few things to do to check the bites and see if it's not too much is to try to place the thumb of the right hand under the jaw, one finger in the mouth, and play with the left hand, high and low, and just check that it's not too tight. Also, along the same lines, the corners of your mouth. Some people curl the corners of their mouth, and this is very bad because this closes up the reed. Now, you know the reed has to hit 
evenly on the tip and on the two rails of the mouthpiece. So if I'm closing up here, biting the reed, it's not going to be able to vibrate. So I want to be careful not to have a curled corners, not to have a bunching up in the jaw, and not to have too much pressure up or down. It's really, as I said before, a matter of trying to keep this whole embouchure area loose and relaxed and let most of the work occur in the larynx and the vocal cords with the auxiliary, uh, obvious and acoustically right phenomenon of the bottom lip controlling the reed as necessary. Uh, a good way to practice this is similar. Take two fingers and place them, or maybe these two fingers, in the corners of your mouth and practice for maybe five, ten minutes just playing long tones with the left hand with the fingers in the corners of your mouth. And then after you take it out, you will feel the tension or lack of tension, hopefully, after doing it for a while. This is a good way to relax. Yeah, kind of like this. good exercise for uh, uh, doing that. Okay, so I think we've covered pretty much the embouchure area. Now we're going to go to the overtone exercises and really try to get some concrete ways of practicing this feeling in the lab.